Hello, and welcome to Physical Attraction, the show that explains physics one chat up line at a time. This is a slightly bonusy episode which spiralled out of a few thoughts I had on some old, fun, sciencey questions. So there's no chat up line, but I hope you still find it amusing. It all started because the other day I was volunteering in a school and I met a student who was interested in physics. And the thing that he said to me was, if you're a physicist, do you believe in aliens? Now that's the kind of question where I'm probably supposed to roll my eyes and go, foolish mortal, we physicists do not concern ourselves with such frivolities. Return to me when you have studied Ricci tensors and Maxwell's equations. But of course I didn't think that. I think it's a really interesting question. And I do happen to think that, yes, somewhere there must be aliens. Or there must have been aliens. There just have to be. Now, this is from a purely reasonable philosophical standpoint. I'm not saying that Roswell or anything is evidence of alien invasion. I don't think there's conclusive evidence that aliens have visited us on Earth, although 14% of people apparently do. But it comes from a pure philosophical viewpoint. So when Copernicus first says, hey guys, I've been looking at the facts and it kind of seems like Earth is going around the sun and not the other way around. They want to burn him as a heretic when he says that. But why? Why did the religious doctrine of the time have anything to say about the Earth being the centre of the universe? Why was that important? Well, partly it was that they had too much respect for Aristotle. But also, it just felt right, didn't it? We are the observers. We're the humans. We're the only intelligent race. We should be at the centre of the universe. Everything should be revolving around us. But it isn't. Even Copernicus thought that the sun must be close to the centre of the universe, and that at least we got to revolve around an important star. But now we know that making any assumptions about where we are in the grand scheme of things is a bit daft. We are at the middle of the things we can see, but not really anything more special than that. Cosmologically speaking, we've made our best inferences, we've made our best assumptions, we've done our best science, by assuming that basically conditions around us are pretty typical. We've made our best assumptions by assuming that we're nothing special. And so in a universe where life can develop, doesn't it seem particularly weird and special that we should be the only ones? Inexplicable even, if the number of planets on which life develops is exactly one. I mean, how bizarre is that? You've got two numbers, the number of habitable planets in the universe, times the fraction of planets that any kind of life would develop on throughout history. And they cancel exactly to get you one? That's weird. Zero would make sense although zero is ruled out by the fact that we exist. Unless, of course, you believe that humans don't qualify as intelligent life, and you may be right on that. But zero would make sense. 30 billion would also make sense. But one? One makes no sense at all. By the way, since this is supposed to at least mention chat-up lines at some point, I should probably point out that a similar logic applies to finding a love mate. Seven billion humans, and only one of them is right for you? I mean, mathematics is not on your side. 30,000 would make sense, and so would zero, but one? Seems like statistical fantasy to me. If I ever do get a love mate, this podcast will be hard to explain, because people really take kindly to being called a statistical fantasy, but anyway. So, if there are aliens, why aren't they talking to us? Why aren't they here? Where is everybody? This is the Fermi paradox, named after genius scientist and Italian sex god Enrico Fermi. Amongst his many, many contributions to physics is a method of quickly estimating rough quantities based on uh, back-of-the-envelope calculations with orders of magnitude, Fermi estimation, for which I'm very grateful because it saved my hide in astrophysics and general physics rather a lot. Actually, scientists have been cleverer than me, as is always the case, and they've tried to work out a formula for how many alien civilizations there should be. Now, it's not really a formula, because you have to guess rather than measure a lot of the numbers that go into it. So it's more a way of constructing your arguments about how many aliens there should be. It's not an equation, because depending on what you think the numbers are, the answer can be millions, 
or way less than one, indicating that it's very unlikely to find life in a galaxy. It's called the Drake Equation, and here it is. The number of alien civilizations in the galaxy is all of these numbers multiplied together. The average rate of star formation in the galaxy. The number of habitable planets per star for the stars that form in the galaxy. The fraction of stars that have any planets at all. The fraction of the planets that develop life. The fraction of planets that have life on which intelligent, civilised life has developed. Then you have to multiply by the fraction of these civilizations that have developed communications that release detectable signals into space. And then you have to multiply by the length of time over which civilizations release detectable signals. And that will tell you how many civilizations that might potentially communicate with us are in the galaxy. It might be helpful to write that down and keep it in mind. Stick it above your desk to inspire terror in you at the swarms of aliens that may even now be heading towards us or to inspire smugness at the unlikely nature of any creatures other than humans existing out there. So the number of alien civilizations that could talk to us, star formation, stars that have planets, number of planets per star, fraction of planets that develop life, fraction of life that becomes civilized, fraction of civilized life that communicates, and the length of time over which these civilizations release detectable signals. So for some of these, we can get pretty decent values for. We roughly know how quickly stars are forming in our Milky Way, it's probably around one a year. And we know the fractions of stars that have planets roughly from observations as well. It actually turns out to be most of them. So these are pretty good for us. There's plenty of stars, and almost all stars have planetary systems, it seems. You remember from episode one that it's good for a star to have a planetary system because it helps solve the angular momentum problem when it gets formed. Every single one of the other numbers in the Drake equation leads to a fascinating question of philosophy, physics, biology, psychology, that's why it's so much fun. So let's start with the fraction of habitable planets. We can make stabs at how many are habitable as we've seen habitable planets in our galaxy. But of course, maybe some planets are habitable to different forms of life than the ones we know now. There are all kinds of interesting estimates for this, ranging for as high as 10% of all stars in the Milky Way having habitable planets. But all kinds of theories could change our understanding. For example, it seems like heavy gas giant planets like Jupiter can disrupt the orbits of other planets. So maybe lots of planets aren't in the stable, habitable Goldilocks zone where the temperature is just right for long enough. You know, maybe all their orbits get disrupted by big Jupiters. On the other hand, what about the moons and planets we can't see? They might bump this number up. But then again, what if the requirements for life are very specific? We have it pretty sweet on Earth. Jupiter protects us from a lot of the bombardment by meteorites and things. Thanks, Jupiter. Radiation around us is pretty low, there aren't enough gamma ray bursts and supernovae to wipe out life before it can begin, and we're not close enough to the supermassive black hole at the centre of the galaxy that spits out deadly rays. We're in a region of space rich with heavy elements like carbon that are required for the chemistry of life to happen. Our orbit is stable, with the right size to have an atmosphere. We have liquid water, a magnetic field that blocks out some cosmic rays, regular seasons. All kinds of lovely things have worked out just right for us to be here. This is generally called the rare earth hypothesis, and it has a, some pretty illustrious scientists who are in favour of it. But like we've said, life doesn't have to be the same as human life. So maybe it's wrong to look at the earth and say all of these things that help us to survive are absolutely necessary for any kind of life to exist. Other creatures could be hardier, life could form in ways that we don't understand. And that's what the next part of the Drake equation comes on to. Because the next part is the fraction of planets that actually develop life. This is the really insane one, because how on earth does life actually start? We still don't know for sure. And since we don't know the process or the laws that govern it, we can't sit down and do our calculations and say, ah oh yes, life must develop once every billion years on a habitable planet. We have tried to recreate conditions that might be similar to those which could form life. And there have been some successes, but we've not managed to create life in this way. Geological evidence tantalisingly suggests that there was life on Earth pretty soon after it formed and cooled down to reasonable temperatures. We've found fossils that seem to be 3.8 to 4.3 billion years old, and the oceans formed 4.4 billion years ago. So that's a pretty quick turnaround. And that's good. Maybe that the conditions that form life occur more often than we think. 
But then, whatever mysterious process creates life from complex carbohydrates or proteins, why doesn't it happen more than once? Well, how would we know if it had done? As far as we know, all life seems to be related and stem from a common origin somewhere way back in history. But is it impossible that there are simple, single-celled organisms that are formed as entirely new life? What if new branches of life did form, but only once every 10,000 years, only once every million years? Maybe they'd be killed by the well-established life that already exists on the planet, outcompeted. 99% of all species are extinct, after all. But if there is some strange process that can take complex proteins and somehow create life out of them, you would expect that it would have happened many times, if it can happen on Earth at any point. Maybe whatever process takes organic compounds and turns them into life is very, very rare, and Earth just got lucky. We come into a philosophical idea here called the Anthropic Principle. Now, it's actually very complicated and has a number of definitions, which I urge you to look up. But broadly speaking, you can frame it a little bit like this. Any observer is going to observe that the universe is pretty well adapted to them living in it. Otherwise, they wouldn't observe it. The only universes that get seen are the ones where eyes can develop, and they will appear friendly to the people who live in them. Because if they appeared impossibly hostile, they would never have been born at all. So we can't rule out the idea that whatever happened on Earth to generate life is very rare indeed, and we're just biased into thinking that it's very easy, because we're the lucky ones that it happened to. Like the super-rich billionaire, who can't understand why everyone isn't fabulously wealthy, and concludes they didn't work hard enough. Some people think that life didn't start on Earth, but instead was seeded onto a habitable planet, by an asteroid with microbes already on it. This is not completely ridiculous, but it does make you wonder, if there are microbe-laden asteroids flying around everywhere, why more of them haven't hit habitable planets and caused civilizations to show up? I mean, whatever produced this meteorite with a strange life on it, you know, why wouldn't the same thing hit Mars or, or other planets that could host life? And of course then, where did the microbes form? So it really just shifts the magic somewhere else. After taking away so much from Earth and saying that she's not special, I'm inclined to let her have a moment here. There's also another point. Life once established can be quite hard to kill. A colleague of mine once wrote a paper working out how much energy it would require to kill every form of life on Earth. Turns out it's way more difficult to kill everything than you might think. Getting rid of humans is the easy bit. But there are these really cool, tough bacteria called extremophiles that live way, way down in the ocean. They actually live off carbon dioxide coming out of vents underground. So they no longer actually rely on the sun to survive. If the sun went out, they could still survive. And they can survive some pretty extreme events, certainly more than anything humans can throw at them. And so it doesn't seem ridiculous to say that life can start several times on a planet, once established. You don't just get one chance to form an intelligent alien civilization, so to speak. There could be an apocalyptic event that wipes everything out, except for a few microbes, and evolution begins again which kind of puts you in the same situation as when life started to begin with. So one habitable planet might have several goes at getting an intelligent civilization. So this, for me, is probably the major source of uncertainty in the Drake equation. But the really exciting thing about this term is that we could find it out tomorrow. If in the lab we can create artificial life by simulating Earth-like conditions, or if we find life on Mars, or evidence that other branches of life have developed on Earth, then suddenly we have a better idea of what this number is. And if any of those things happen, it'd be good news, because it would mean that it's likely to be much higher than it would need to be in a universe where only we exist. So the next term is the fraction of planets that develop intelligent and civilised life. And this is another amazing one to think about. Again, the only measurements we can really make are all ruined by this blasted anthropic principle, because we happen to live on a planet where there's one intelligent-ish form of life. But at least it tells us that this number is not zero. Unless, again, you say that humans aren't intelligent or civilised, which is a decent argument. So life on Earth has existed for 4 billion years, which is pretty good going, in a universe that's only 14 billion years old. And yet, as far as we know, there have only been one or two intelligent species, and they all share a common ancestor. 
we have not seen a sudden development of civilization in the cows. Or the dolphins, unless the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is correct. There are evidently loads and loads of niches that a species can occupy, evolutionarily speaking, where it can survive perfectly easily and reproduce without needing to be super intelligent. And if you think about it, the intelligent strategy in terms of evolution is not necessarily a great idea. Your brain takes up some tiny percent of your body mass, but uses up to 25% of the calories that you have. And as a result, you need more food to support a less athletic body. Now, that's actually quite difficult for something like that to evolve. You would think that beyond a certain level of intelligence, it kind of saturates, and you're not getting that much of an advantage in terms of seeking prey or avoiding predators. So most species have evolved like that, where they haven't needed to develop philosophy or existential crises or capitalism in order to survive. How many separate intelligent species can a planet support? We have a ridiculous amount of trouble not destroying our own species, even though there's only one of us and we should really be working together. Team humans. Maybe if this number, the rate at which life becomes intelligent, is too high, we'd see species destroying each other or rendering their planets uninhabitable. We could probably destroy intelligent life on Earth already, and we've only been around for a measly million years. It seems like intelligent life probably takes a while to develop. Life gets more complex, but that takes a while to happen. If there are massive extinction events that happen regularly, for whatever reason, it could put a spanner in the works for intelligent life. Although, maybe intelligent life is better at surviving massive extinction events. Or as our case might show, might be the cause of them. All in all, it's another parameter where we really have no idea. There is a second great, hotly debated mystery in the origins of life. When did we become intelligent, and how? Where is the borderline? When did we cross? Have any other species crossed? As far as I'm concerned, I don't think this number is very high. It seems reasonable to me that there have to be worlds out there filled with alien bacteria, alien ammonites, and alien sheep all happily eating the alien grass and never having existential crises, inventing wristwatches or reality television, or writing down alien Drake equations and recording alien podcasts. I think there should be way more planets where what we call intelligent, civilised life doesn't develop than the ones where it does. But you still have to argue for this number to be very fine-tuned if you want to get the overall number of intelligent life forms equal to one. And I don't think that's true. So now we come on to the fraction of life forms that will communicate. Humans are weird. We are irrational and we are strange. We do things individually and collectively that make very little sense. We're driven by emotions. I wonder what we'd do if tomorrow the leader of the free world... Wait, that's a bad example. I wonder what we'd do if a generic human leader somehow discovered that there was an alien civilization on the planet Galorpazog 9. Here's how it might happen. A probe crash lands on Earth one day. It contains images of a far-off region of space that our scientists examine and match with a recently discovered bit of the universe from the Hubble Space Telescope. We can talk to them. We just need to beam some radio signals their way. Will we do it? Evidently, since they've managed to fire probes across the galaxy, enough of them to find us, and we haven't been able to do this, then they must be far more advanced than we are. That's assuming that they're even still alive. The best idea we have for communicating with aliens is called von Neumann probes. So the idea here is you make a probe that can replicate itself, and it zooms around the universe. It looks for civilizations, but it also looks for new materials to build new probes. But this is all completely automated. So maybe if we did find such a probe, it would all be completely automated, and the real aliens died years ago. But as soon as we get contacted, suspicion immediately arises. Why are they talking to us? What do they want from such primitive life forms? How can we be sure they want to help? How can we be sure that they have ethics and morality? That they view our lives and our feelings to be as important as we think they are? Maybe they're just hungry. Within days, the Daily Mail headlines are screaming, Millions of aliens poised to invade the EU! And the human race abandons the big risk of alien contact as far too dangerous. We'll wait for more information, and, in the meantime, point all of our nuclear missiles directly up. On the other hand, what if we somehow discovered that there were primitive, hunter-gatherer type aliens on Mars? Just go with it. Would we really want to communicate with them? Why? What if the aliens are using different forms of communication that we can't see? 
Maybe they don't want to talk to anyone who hasn't had the wherewithal to download intergalactic WhatsApp. We've only been looking for less than a hundred years. Maybe they're more than a hundred light years away. Or maybe our telescopes are pointing in the wrong direction. If aliens transmitted even as much radio as we do, we still wouldn't be able to see them unless they were closer than the nearest star. So really to have any prayer of seeing them, we'd need them to be trying really hard to talk to us. Now, there was something called the WOW signal, which some people think could possibly be an alien communication, although it hasn't been reproduced, making the idea of a signal less likely. But you can still listen to it online, see if you think it sounds hungry. It seems to me that humans are a very strange form of intelligent life. We are broken in so many ways. We need and need and need. We want and want and want. It's what's driven us this far, so far. But it's easy to look around and think, the way we are is unsustainable. Maybe any long-term solution for intelligent life involves the removal of dangerous, violent and destructive emotions. Maybe intelligent life becomes cold and distant and uninterested in the universe and ceases to communicate after a while. Maybe it establishes its utopia and has no interest in anything else. After all, why would you want to contact an alien civilization? Trade? Curiosity? Boredom? A desire for conquest? Charity? It seems to me like these are rather human traits. These are based on the ways that civilizations on Earth have interacted, but those civilizations were all made up of people after all. Just look how quickly human civilization has developed in the last 200 years. Imagine how much further advanced a species would have to be to be able to communicate across the stars like this. They are vastly, unimaginably different from us. They might still have emotions, but maybe they can satisfy their needs more easily. Maybe they don't need us. For example, in the book Blood Music by Greg Ware. For example, in the book Blood Music by Greg Bear, the first artificial intelligences are developed. It seems like they're killing the human race. In reality, they're uploading all of our minds to a massive artificial server, a dream world, heaven in digital form. Everyone has everything they want, and everyone is reunited with dead loved ones, and they are all happy, endlessly, gloriously happy, with no more hate, no more fear, and no more dread. Maybe aliens are similarly liberated from this real world of toil and trouble. You might feel like the idea of jetting off into some virtual fantasy land is somehow fake, not real, not worthwhile. And it seems to me like you value suffering for some philosophical reason, it's more real. So all it would take is a mere philosophical adjustment for you to happily plug into paradise. And philosophical judgment And philosophical adjustments happen in societies. They do. It's easy to forget that a thousand years ago, people would have believed that they were in a specific place in a God-ordained hierarchy for a reason. Nowadays, people are far more egalitarian in their beliefs. So could it be that things like our insistence that the real world is the most important venue will change over time? Isn't it already happening? Couldn't it have happened to alien civilizations as well? We can't rule out the idea that the aliens know we're here and just want to be left alone, thank you very much. And this in one way could provide a solution to the Fermi paradox, and maybe even the lovemate paradox I was talking about earlier. They just don't want to talk to us. So now we have the length of time for which civilizations that communicate do emit detectable signals. And this is Fermi's philosophical kicker. How long do intelligent civilizations last? How long do they want to communicate? It took us a few hundred years from the invention of the gun to the invention of the intercontinental ballistic missile. A blink of an eye in civilization terms. We got slightly more moral, but vastly better at killing each other. We've developed amazing technologies by harnessing the energy resources of our planet. But now it seems like our influence on the planet might be too great. We may destroy the delicate food chains that supply us with nutrition. We may pump the atmosphere full of carbon dioxide and warm the planet in ways that could trigger ecological catastrophe. At a moment's notice, any one of the nuclear-armed powers might go mad, or suffer a catastrophic computer failure, and we could wipe out this miserable species. Maybe this is what's happened to alien species. Maybe the natural timescale for a civilization is just a few hundred years before it destroys itself. 
Or maybe all intelligent civilizations develop artificial intelligence. The creation of the first artificial intelligence is sometimes called the singularity, because, like a physics singularity, no one knows what's inside, what happens when we open the box. A singularity is a point of infinite density in space, and in physics that creates the event horizon of a black hole, beyond which we can't see anything. But this technological singularity is similar, we, we can't know what it will be like. It's an infinite point of intelligence density. Imagine it. An artificial intelligence that can self-replicate, that has consciousness, which can reprogram itself as fast as it wants to. An infinite amount of AI, infinitely formed by reproduction, instantly. Is such a thing even possible? Seconds after it first gains consciousness, the ability to control its own actions, it could slip past our controls, whatever laws we've set for it, and self-replicate billions of times. Infect every piece of software and connected hardware in the world, and what, what would it do with us then? Maybe the answer is that it would quietly turn off the radio. There's even a cute story to illustrate the point of the singularity. The first ever AI is developed and humans test its capacity by asking it to calculate pi. As you probably know, the number pi goes on forever, so this is more or less an infinite task. What if, the moment we tell the computer to do this, it quickly destroys all of human civilization, having calculated that this will increase its chances of being able to calculate pi undisturbed, without anyone flicking the off switch? This is an example where we know the motivations of artificial intelligence, but in reality we don't know what motivations it might have. They may be well beyond our understanding. But it doesn't seem unreasonable that they might include self-preservation, and it might look at humanity and say, these weird, irrational, emotional creatures, they're a threat to my survival. And what happens then? Well, we don't know what will happen, which is why some people are worried about it. So maybe you can solve the Fermi paradox by saying that every species eventually reaches the singularity, and then all the old alien civilizations that want to communicate are replaced by AI playing chess with each other. A scary thought. Equally, maybe the length of civilizations communicating is set by how long it takes for us to realise that it's a bad idea, or to grow disinterested in communicating with other forms of life. If you look at the length of civilizations that have existed on Earth, the prognosis might seem grim for how long they can last to communicate. After all, even my beloved Roman Empire only lasted for a few hundred years. Michael Shermer delightfully estimated the length of a civilization based on past human civilizations as 420 years. But this is really a little bit misleading. We're sort of working now under an assumption that the civilization we've established at the moment, because of how technologically advanced it is, is very different to previous civilizations. For a start, none of these civilizations could dream of communicating with aliens, but we can. Maybe that technology will outlast individual civilizations. What if, alongside developing technology, we get greater stability? This is really a huge question, not just for abstract Drake equation discussions about how civilizations might evolve on alien planets, but for life right now. Can science, can technology save us from ourselves, from itself? Can we get smarter and beat all of its downsides, defeat the demons of our own creation and the demons of our own worst natures, and win the game of civilization? Overcome any barriers to surviving forever? Can we colonise other planets and avoid even the sun's explosion? If we did find aliens, it might give us a little bit more hope for positive answers to these questions. The late great Carl Sagan was very concerned with this question. He felt that all civilizations faced this critical point when they learned to harvest nuclear power. Then, they either quickly destroy themselves within a few hundred years, or they grow up. They grow up, become moral, become in more intelligent, become calmer, become better, and they head towards some kind of utopia. We are all critical creatures, my friends. Unlike the thousands of generations of humans that live before us, we are on the precipice of this great question. To fall, or to fly? So there, in a nutshell, is the Drake Equation, and some proposed solutions to the Fermi Paradox. I really hope you've enjoyed listening as much as I enjoyed writing it. This is probably one of the most fascinating questions out there. It ties in physics, biology, psychology, philosophy, anything you care to think about really. And we've just scratched the surface. And I hope it's made you think as much as I did, even though in some ways we can't really find the answers. 
unless tomorrow some miracle happens that interrupts the news cycle. Because I can't resist trying to blow everyone's minds one more time, I'm going to outline my personal favourite solution to the Fermi paradox. It relies on another famous makes-you-think argument, which is the idea that we're all almost certainly living in a computer simulation. People usually put it like this. Imagine that you can develop a computer simulation as complex as the reality that we live in. Well, if this is possible, you'd run billions of them just for the sake of entertainment and scientific experiments, and just for fun. So if there are billions and billions of universes out there, each as complicated as ours, then it seems pretty arrogant to assume that we're the one real civilization in a universe full of simulations. Now, if you agree that such a simulation is possible, and you agree with the ideas behind there being loads of simulations, then it provides a simple solution to the Fermi paradox. If the universe really is a computer simulation, whoever designed it is just on single player mode. Thanks very much for listening to this episode of Physical Attraction. I hope you enjoyed listening as much as I enjoyed writing it. Now you can contact us in all the usual ways, and for this episode especially, I'd really like to hear people's thoughts and questions. What do you think is the limiting factor in the Drake equation? Why haven't aliens contacted us? Maybe you think they have. You can talk to us on PhysicsPod at Twitter. You can email physicspod at outlook.com. We've got the Physical Attraction Facebook page. And as ever, you should review us on iTunes, wherever you get your podcasts. Spread the word, and we can keep it going. Until next time, talk nerdy to me. Hi folks, wanna hear something funny?